guys welcome back to my channel I'm Christy before we jump in today um, I just want to give you a heads up it is a dreary rainy day in Oklahoma again I'm not feeling well um, so I have my little my newest puppy here this is Smalls so he's gonna stay here and keep me happy um, but we're gonna push through and we are going to talk about Carrie Roberts today. She was not cross-examined, so all of this information came from direct. And it was interesting. She She's a very stark contrast to Jen McCabe when she was testifying. Um, the way Jen talked about Carrie, I kind of figured that maybe she would be more like how Jen was on the stand, but mostly she was all right. You know, I, I tolerated her much better than I tolerated Jen McCabe. There are things with her testimony that I'm kind of, mm, I don't know about that, but overall, like I said, I think she was a better witness than Jen McCabe, but yeah, so if you don't mind, please give this a like on your way in. And if you're not subscribed, get subscribed. Share this out so more people can see it. You can use hashtag Karen Reed, Karen Reed Trial, um, Canton, John O'Keefe. There, there's a million hashtags you could use, but... Mainly, I would appreciate it if you would give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Those things are free for you to do, and they really help the channel, and they help the videos get out there to more people, so more people can view them. So, on. All right, my daughter is on the dogs, so hopefully they will cooperate with us to get through this video. Um, again, like I said, Karen Reed trial. We've got Carrie Roberts. I think I spelled everything out on the presentation, but just in case I happen to slip up, I have this shorthand in my notebook, and she's written down as K-Rob because... Karen Reed and Carrie Roberts, two KRs would be too confusing. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so she's K-Rob. So if you see K-Rob on any of these slides, it's Carrie. And all right, let's dive in. I swear this pneumonia cough is never going to go away. Okay, so this is Carrie Roberts. She's lived in Canton for 10 years. She's married to Kurt Roberts, who you will probably remember. He went out to CF McCarthy's with Michael Camerano and John O'Keefe that night. And he only went to meet up with them because he said that Michael Camerano had called him a pussy and he couldn't let that stand. So he had to go up there and, I guess, like, make it right, make an appearance. So she's married to kurt roberts they have two kids she is an executive assistant she's been doing that for 17 years you can hear steve yelling i've told you he has opinions on this case he watches it every day with me um she's known john o'keefe since high school so on january 28th of 2022 she went bowling with her daughter and her daughter's friend at westgate lanes in brockton she was home by 8 30 p.m her husband was home but her son was not 
Then her husband, Kurt, went and met John O'Keefe and Michael Camerano at CF McCarthy's. Michael Camerano is a childhood friend of Kurt, and they grew up together, I think they said Milton. I'd have to go back. Um, Kurt got home around 10.30 p.m. <coughs> if you remember, he said he did the Irish exit at the bar. Um, he didn't want to go out in the first place because of the snow, so he just kind of made his appearance and got out. Um, Carrie has known John since high school in Braintree. He was one of her closest friends, and John was one year older than her. Her son and John's nephew Patrick went to school together, and they played hockey and baseball. She said that she saw John daily. It was a seven to eight minute drive to his Meadows Avenue house. And she picked up Patrick on Wednesdays because he would be, John would be working in Boston and couldn't get him. So she would pick Patrick up on Wednesdays when John was working. And she said Jen McCabe took care of Kaylee more so than Carrie did. She said John dated a lot of people and he would always have her husband, Kurt, meet them to kind of say like, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, you should stay with her or no, get rid of her kind of thing. She said that she met Karen Reed in July of 2020, that she came to her house with John. She said Karen took care of the kids a lot. Her and Karen Reed weren't girlfriends and they didn't go out. As couples, her and Kurt and Karen and John, they, they didn't go out as couples. On January 29th, she woke up to a call from Karen Reed at 5 a.m. It was the second call. She had missed a call one to two minutes before. She said Karen screamed, John is dead, carry, 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 and hung up. Karen called back and said, I'm afraid John might be dead. He might have got hit by a plow. He didn't come home last night. I wasn't supposed to stay in Canton last night, and he'd never leave Kaylee alone. On the 28th, she said that John had texted her, Carrie. Um, her son had gotten into a scuffle with another boy at school, and Patrick had heard about it. Patrick wasn't there. He had a doctor's appointment or something. And so John was just checking in to see if her son was okay. And I mean, we all have to admit, John sounds like the kind of friend you would want. Am I right? I mean, he's, he sounds like he was just an awesome, awesome human. So she said that Karen had checked Kaylee's phone to see if John had called. Carrie asked, where are you now? And Karen said, I'm driving. Can I come to your house? Will you drive my car? I don't remember anything from last night. We drank so much. I don't remember anything. Carrie told her that she needed to go home. Karen needed to go home back to John's house to be with Kaylee if she was there by herself. And that she, Carrie, would go out and look for John. She said, you're going to get a DUI. You were drinking all night last night. You don't remember anything. You don't need to be driving. Carrie says Karen was frantic. Karen never came to her house. Carrie was outside in her car waiting for Karen to come. Carrie called 911 to ask if there were any plow accidents. She called Good Samaritan Hospital in Milton to see if anyone had been brought in from a car accident. Carrie and her husband, Kurt, both called John and got no answer. She said that she had mutual friends with Officer Good, who took the 911 call, but she had never met him. She said, Karen called and said, I'm at Jen McCabe's house. She's going to drive my car. Carrie tells her to just stay there, that she'll come there and follow them to drop Karen's car off at John's, and then they would all take Carrie's car to go look for John. Karen said she didn't look in the house for John, which seems weird. So Carrie said, let's go to the house to look and see if he's passed out somewhere in the house. Carrie really sounds like the person, like, she's the one with the plan. She sounds very um, action-oriented. She's like, okay, I'm going to call these people and see if he's been brought in. I'm going to do this. You know, she seems like she's on a mission. Like, she has a plan. Um, 
she said that she had met Jen McCabe once when, again, the story, John took them to Reebok to get the kids shoes with his 50% discount, and then they went to Hillside for lunch. She says that she wasn't friends with Jen McCabe and that she knew where Jen lived because she had picked Kaylee up there a few times for John. Sorry, I keep doing this. My husband had to take my ring to get it appraised so we can get it insured, and it's it's driving me crazy not having it on. Okay, at Jen's house, she pulled in behind Karen's car, which is not what Jen McCabe testified to. Remember, she was like, she pulled up and the plow pulled up. Little difference. Like I said, devil's in the details. I have them, and I'm giving them to you. So Jen and Karen were in Karen's car talking. She's still on Bluetooth, so she can hear them. And that is not what Jen testified to. If you remember, Jen said that Carrie called Karen. She was actually on the phone with her the whole time. Like, she she was on Bluetooth. So she could hear Jen and Karen in the car talking. She said that Karen said she remembered leaving John at the waterfall. And Jen said, no, I saw you pull up to my sister's house. Again, not what Jen or Matt McCabe said. According to them, the conversation about, remember, Matt was the one that remembered, not Jen. And he's like, we saw them pull up outside your sister's house. And that allegedly happened earlier when they were on the phone, when Karen was on the phone with Jen, uh, when Karen was on the phone with Jen McCabe. Um, and she was still in the house. According to Carrie, this conversation is happening in Karen's car. She's overhearing it on the Bluetooth. And like I said in the earlier testimony from Jen and Matt, it sounded like Jen didn't remember that at all, but Matt remembered seeing them pull up. Now, according to Carrie, Jen says, no, I saw you pull up to my sister's house. Again, details. Carrie says, at some point, Karen said, what about my taillight? Two times. Carrie, since she's parked behind her, looks and sees that there was a piece missing. So they went to John's house. She pulled in behind Jen McCabe. Jen was driving Karen's SUV. She talks about John being a neat freak and the whole take off your shoes rule. They show her the driveway ring video. They go in the right side garage door. She says it wouldn't close and she doesn't remember if it was open when they got there. But per Michael Camerano and Jen McCabe's testimony, it was open. She says that she and Jen took off their shoes, but Karen didn't. Again, this I don't know why this is such a huge offense. But she says John had the Ring app on his phone and checked it all the time. And this lady says, at some point, a lot. That's why it's on the thumbnail. At some point, Karen pointed out her taillight in the driveway saying, look at my taillight, two times. Carrie said, you said you don't remember anything from last night. Karen says, do you think I hit him? Two times. Carrie says, no, I don't think you hit him. I think you probably hit something, but let's just go in the house and look for him. Now, she's asked when Karen pointed out the taillight in the driveway, and Carrie says after watching the video, it must have been when we, it must not have been when we got there. It must have been when we were leaving. She had originally said that she said, look at my taillight when they got there, just like Jen McCabe testified. But after seeing the video, she's like, well, it didn't happen when we got there, so I guess I'll say it happened when we left. Allegedly. Carrie says there was one piece of metal sticking out where the taillight was broken. And she remembers that because she thought someone's going to catch their sleeve on that. Karen was upstairs standing in John's room. She saw that the bed was made. Jen was in Kaylee's room and Carrie was looking downstairs. Kind of a different picture than what Jen gave. She kind of was like, I, you know, Carrie was looking around, but Jen made it sound like she was doing all the things, right? Carrie says, let's go. He's not in the house. Again, she's a woman on a mission. He's not here. Let's go. 
Carrie says Karen and Jen wanted to go back to 34 Fairview because that's where Jen said she saw Karen pull up the night before. Again, this is different than what Jen testified to. Jen made it sound like Karen was the one that really wanted to go. She was the only one bringing it up that they needed to go to Fairview because, as she said, she knew he was there. And Jen said that Karen had said she dropped him off there. But according to Carrie, Karen and Jen both wanted to go back to 34 Fairview. And the reason they wanted to go was because that's where Jen said she saw Karen pull up the night before. I've had this feeling in this case. I haven't said anything in the other videos. But after this testimony, I really felt it even more. It almost feels like gaslighting of Karen. You know, that... Jen's like, I saw you pull up with him the night before. So now it's in Karen's head. Oh, shit, I don't remember that. I, I must have been there if, if they're saying that. So is that where I left him kind of thing? Um, I don't know if gaslighting is the right word, but I just feel like this narrative was kind of introduced to Karen when Karen doesn't really have a clear memory. Like she thinks she left him at the waterfall. And then everybody else is telling her, no, no, no. We saw you at 34 Fairview. So, like I said, it kind of feels like gaslighting to me, but that's just my opinion. You can let me know in the comments what you think. Um, please comment all your thoughts on this video because I love discussing back and forth with y'all. Um, she says Karen really wanted to go there. Well, if... Jen's telling you that you left him there. I can see why she's like frantically wanting to get back there and see like, you know, if this is the last place anybody saw them, maybe that's where he's at. So she says that she didn't even know that Jen had a sister. Uh, Jen was giving directions because Carrie didn't know where they were going. She said it was bad driving and there were plows out and the visibility was poor. It was a blizzard. She was familiar with the area because the commuter rail that she takes to work is near there, which, if you remember, in Brian Albert's testimony when he was testifying about the railroad tracks being back there and that the commuter train used it, I was like, how does this matter? I think this is why it matters. That's That was like a reference point for Carrie. She's like, oh yeah, that's near where I catch the commuter rail. She said the JF school, JFK school is also in the area and her son and Patrick had gone to a home daycare across the street from JFK. She said Karen was frantic. She wouldn't put on her seatbelt. She was leaning between the front seats and she was texting in the back seat. And we know that she was texting oh, what was her Cam, Mrs. Camerano, the nurse, Michael's wife. She was texting her back and forth. So Karen and Jen are having a conversation, which remember when I said, is Jen just being quiet during all this screaming that's going on? Well, apparently not. She's having a conversation um, with Karen and they were talking about some woman that Carrie didn't know, Bella's mom. Karen said, Bella's mom never liked me. That is not even close to what Jen McCabe testified to. She made it sound like Karen was just like, oh my God, I bet he's with Ashley. Could he be with Ashley? On and on and on. Like, you know, jealous rage about Bella's mom. And the only thing that Carrie testifies to is that she's like, Bella's mom never liked me. Okay. There's a lot of people that don't like me. Carrie says there was a woman that John dated that lived on Spring Lane, which is off of Chapman and near Fairview. Jen had said Fairview was near Spring Lane, and Carrie said, oh, where the dance instructor lives. Again, she said that she was just using this as a point of reference to figure out where she was going. John had once dated a dance instructor. Karen said, do you think he could have gone there? Again, not how Jen testified to this exchange. She made it sound like Carrie was like, oh, do you think he went to whoever the dance instructor's house is? And that Karen starts freaking out. 
who is that? Who is she? On and on and on. No. According to Carrie, Karen said, do you think he could have gone there? Which makes sense. You're trying to think of any possibility that ends with your loved one being okay and being somewhere, right? So Carrie said she was just using that as a reference point because she didn't know where Fairview was. And the dance instructor was for Kaylee and John had dated her 10 years prior. Jen said, my sister's house is right up here. Suddenly Karen says, there he is, times two. Let me out of the effing car, or let me out, let me the F out of this car. And she starts kicking the door to get out. Carrie looked over. She says that she didn't see anything. So she looks at Jen and says, she's crazy. Which Jen said that she said she's crazy. She's batshit crazy. She unlocked the door and she sat back and watched. She said Karen ran over to a mound of snow. Here we go again. At some point, Carrie realized it was the shape of a body. Karen lifted up John's shirt and started to lay on him. The mound of snow was behind her vehicle. They had driven just past it. So it was right behind her vehicle. So they had gone by and Karen saw it as they were passing. Carrie cried when Lally showed Sarah's dash cam video of arriving on the scene. And it, it, it got me because she's the first person that cried for John rather than crying for themselves. I mean, Paul was kind of emotional, but she was crying. And you could tell, like, John really meant the world to her. And it was nice to see that somebody actually cared about John they're not just up there crying because they're being harassed or whatever. So Carrie had Jen get baby blankets out of the back of her car to wrap John in. Carrie ran over and dug his head out of the snow. John was on his back. She said that she brushed the snow off his face and there was blood coming out of his nose and mouth. She said John's right eye looked like a golf ball, but his left eye was fine. She said he was bleeding at the back of his head, and she knows this because she saw blood on the blanket that she put under his head. Sorry. Dog's in the house. It's raining. Okay. So she saw blood on the blanket that she had put under his head. She said he was completely covered with snow, about three to four inches of snow. She told Karen to get off of him because she was going to do CPR. She told Jen to call 911. Carrie started chest compressions and Karen was giving him mouth to mouth. Carrie gets CPR certified every two years through her employer. Again, like I said, this really sounds like a person that is like, this is what we need to do. You know, the woman with the plan. This is what needs to happen. She's telling everybody, okay, you call 911. You do mouth to mouth. I'm going to do compressions. She said Karen was frantic and running around saying, did I hit him? Times two. Is he dead? Times two. She said both of these things more than once. She said first responders were there within 10 minutes of the 911 call and no neighbors came outside. She said Karen was running around John's body while EMTs were trying to work on him. Carrie was by her car and she doesn't know where Jen was or what Jen was doing. She said, and if you watch in the dash cam videos, Jen, she doesn't really go over to the area where John is much. You know, Carrie and Karen are both there, but Jen is, she's not there as much. Um... She says that she couldn't tell the difference between the road and the grass where John was laying because of the snow. She didn't know if he was in the road or if he was in the yard. Karen was loudly saying, is he dead? This time, times three. John was taken in the ambulance. Carrie says that John's phone was underneath him and that she saw grass underneath him and everything else was covered with snow. So she said that she picked John's 
or that John's phone was under his back on the right side near the middle. So kind of like she said near his like shoulder blade in the back. She picked it up and she put it in her pocket and then she gave it to a first responder when she was asked for it. Officer Good told Karen to calm down because she was frantic. At some point, Karen and Jen were in the back of a cruiser to warm up. Carrie stood outside of the ambulance and could see the EMTs working on John. She said they're working on him two times. At some point, Karen grabbed the front of Carrie's jacket and screamed in her face, Are they working on him? Is he alive? Carrie said they're working on him two times. They wouldn't be working on him if he was dead. Karen had them hold hands and pray. At some point, Karen had blood on her hands and said she had her period, and they said, no, that's not your blood, it's John's. The ambulance left. Karen got in Carrie's car. Jen was going up to the door of the house. Carrie had called John's mom and dad. At some point, Karen was on the phone with John's sister-in-law, Erin, which we know she testified to that, telling her John's dead. So Carrie grabbed the phone and said he's not dead. He's in the back of an ambulance. He's been in an accident. Aaron said Paul, John's brother, was going to the hospital that they were taking John to. And Jen was going into the house to wake up her sister. John's parents didn't have four-wheel drive. So Carrie said, I'm going to come get you and I'll take you to the hospital. Matt McCabe showed up. At some point before she left, he asked if she wanted him to come with her to get John's parents. She said no, and he went in the house. Carrie left with Karen. Karen said, if anything happens to John, I'm going to kill myself. You need to take care of these kids. Carrie said, he's not going to die. No one is doing anything of that nature. Officer Good let her leave. He had her give him her phone number before leaving. Officer Good called her and said, do you have Miss Reed with you? Please bring her back. Her parents have called in a suicide. She's saying she's suicidal and they want her sectioned. Before leaving the scene, Carrie hadn't talked to any police officers besides giving her name and phone number. She took Karen back. Karen spoke to her mom. Carrie took the phone and gave Karen's mom her phone number and said, I'm going to the hospital. Karen's mom said, please make sure she does not have her purse. She has medication in her purse that I don't want her to take. Back at the scene, Karen got out and walked to the ambulance. Carrie had Karen's phone and she told first responders that she had Karen's phone and that Karen's mom said, make sure she doesn't have her purse. Then she went to pick up the O'Keefe's. When Carrie arrived at Good Samaritan Hospital, Paul was already there. She went to the waiting area. John's cousin works on the switchboard there, and they had been talking with her on the way to the hospital. Carrie went to the bathroom to clean herself up, and then she went to the chapel. She said Karen had called her repeatedly from the ambulance, asking if she was coming to the hospital. Karen told John's mom that she dropped John off at a party, and Mrs. O'Keefe said, You just left him? And Mr. O'Keefe said, just leave her alone. She's been through enough. Karen called a lot while they were at the hospital to see if Carrie knew anything, if John was dead. She said that she was basically hanging up and calling back over and over at least 10 times. Carrie went to talk to John's cousin, who told her that Dr. Rice was going to meet with the family and they would be told how John was doing, and they would bring John's family back to see him. The family was being called in by Dr. Rice. Carrie stayed in the waiting area, and then Mrs. O'Keefe came out and told Carrie that John was gone and asked her if she wanted to see him. Carrie says she wanted to see him because she figured that it would be better than when she saw him the last time, that, you know, maybe he was cleaned up. But she says it was not better, it was actually worse. She describes that John was in a neck brace and both eyes were huge. They were black and filled with blood or fluid and they were huge. She said, 
at the scene that the right one was swollen, but the left one was fine. Now they're both swollen. <clears throat> she said John had scratches on his right forearm. She came back out to the waiting area. Mrs. O'Keefe had wanted to get John's necklace off, but Carrie couldn't get it. So Paul and Mrs. O'Keefe went back in to get the necklace off. Karen had called her and said her father was going to be coming and asked Carrie to keep an eye out for him. When Mr. Reed walked in, Mr. O'Keefe recognized him and said that's Karen's father. So Carrie went over and said, Mr. Reed, Mr. O'Keefe would like to thank you. And she says she just stood there because she didn't know what to do. Carrie took Mr. O'Keefe in her car and Paul took Mrs. O'Keefe in his car. She dropped Mr. O'Keefe off at John's house and then she went home. Later on the 29th, two state police officers came to her house. She says it wasn't Trooper Proctor. They spoke with her and her husband separately. She talked to Trooper Proctor one time at Jen McCabe's house on the phone. She said that Mrs. O'Keefe advised them to make a timeline because, quote, this could be a while and you guys aren't going to remember something. Jen McCabe said, I don't think you've told them that regarding Karen saying John was dead when she first called Carrie. My question is, how did Jen McCabe know what Carrie had told police? How did she know that she hadn't already told them that? So Carrie asked to speak with Trooper Proctor so someone would have it documented. She met with troopers at Jen McCabe's house on February 1st. Again, not Trooper Proctor. Within the next two days, she said troopers wanted to clone her phone. Basically, they wanted to do an extraction. And she said she got her phone back in seven to eight hours, which sounds normal. Um, she never talked to anyone from Canton PD. She said that she knows Officer Link and their daughters are friends. She doesn't hang out with the Link socially, but her and his wife are friends. On January 30th, her, her daughter, Jen McCabe, and Jen's daughter went to the O'Keefe's. She dropped her daughter off at the Links afterwards. Jen's daughter stayed at the O'Keefe's. Carrie talked to Link's wife. She was checking on how everyone was doing. She says they talked for 45 minutes, and she says, I'm a talker, just like Jen McCabe said. She doesn't know where they went after that. She said that she assumes they went home, and like I said, there was no cross done on this witness. So, again, this is what they pulled up to that morning. Um, they would have been past where John was found when Karen started saying, there he is, there he is. You know, maybe. And I'll show you this video again of the drive that they would have been making. Sloping. So the house was pretty much even grade. But now the road starts sloping. There's a dead end street over here to my left. That's where we're gonna turn around. And uh, you can see that it's a windy neighborhood. So that could be an issue when we hear about the plow driver's testimony. Exactly. Which we're waiting to hear. So now this is the approach the, the morning that the three women, including Karen Reed, who's in the back middle seat, make that approach and here we are already. So the question is, what are you going to see as you approach the house and the flagpole and everything else that will be coming up on the left-hand side? Um, what, are, what are your thoughts about what you're seeing as you're driving? So I'm noticing that it was a grade up. And I'm also noticing that you can't really see the house if those trees are right there. But again, it would have been in the winter time. Um, how about where John O'Keefe's body was? The, how about where his body was? Is, is, right that, at, is that more difficult because of the curve or is it easier? You can see the flagpole as soon as you uh, pass the curve on the street and you're approaching in this direction towards Cedar Crest. Clear as day, you can see it. But again, if the plow had been here before, Karen Reed, Carrie Roberts, and Jen McCabe would have approached the house. Maybe they couldn't see past the snow. Uh, the two women that were in the front seat and Karen Reed, you know, 
she starts, uh, according to them and their testimony, she starts screaming and kicking in the back seat, saying, let me out, let me out, he's over here, and then she just runs over here and rips up his shirt, takes up her shirt, and lays on top of him. And then Carrie Roberts, you know, her testimony, she wipes away the snow from his face, and then she says that it was grass underneath him. So, so when they're there the right next day, here. obviously much more snow. There'll be much more snow that following morning as they uh, approach this area. Um, but coming around that curve, to me, it's, it's not quite as open and obvious as coming from the other direction. Yes, because the other direction, you're coming from an uphill, slightly down, and it's more level and foam. And then the rest of the neighborhood goes downhill, and there are curves downhill. So there's twists and turns on both sides of where this home is located. The former Albert home, for many generations, we might add. But, um, yeah, this is where we are. This is fascinating. Now, there's no, just kind of, there are no street lights anywhere, right? That you've seen? I'm noticing there is a street light, yes. So there is a street light directly in front of 34 Fairview that Austin is showing you right there. But um, I'm not sure how much light it gives and if it was on that night. I mean, this was during a blizzard. There was a lot going on. Um, but there is a light is right in front of this house. And there's also a lot of lights at the home on their porch. They have porch lights. But again, I don't know if they would have been on that they, night. They, weren't, they didn't come on until, well, we don't know if they were on that night, right? But the following morning, it took a while for them to come on. But I don't think they're going to illuminate that part at all. Because you're, you're not in front of the house. You're sort of to the side. So, Matt, what's, what's your final analysis uh, taking this drive? And obviously, it's not dark. It's not snowing, uh, which makes it, uh, a, a, I guess, a, very different from a, to a certain extent. Uh, but the road is the road. As you're driving, um, do, you, do you see that area as you drive? Or if you're driving and you're looking, are you more focused on the road as you just did this, this drive? I think that you would be more focused on the road if it was snowing because there are turns. And a lot of these people didn't know exactly where this house was. There's that part of it. But I can't get past the fact that where John O'Keefe lay dying on the front of the yard here, you can see it from every direction as you approach this house. You can definitely see it. And, I mean, that's burned in my mind at this point. Matt Johnson returning to the scene tonight. Okay, so that's how Carrie would have driven. That's the way that they approached the house. Again, here is, this picture is also taken from that same direction. So you can kind of see what it looked like when they pulled up. You can see all the footprints around where, you know, John was found. So I don't know. Um, like I said, I was kind of conflicted with this witness online. She was catching a lot of hate for being a mean girl and part of the mean girl club and all this stuff. But I found her easier to take than Jen McCabe. Um, like I said, some of her testimony, some of it matched up almost too perfectly, and then some of it was wildly different. So, I don't know. What did you guys think of Carrie Roberts? Do you believe what she said? Do you believe she was coached by Jen? Or do you believe Jen? I've got something in my hair. Oh, my God. You guys, I've been sitting here for how long with something in my hair? Uh, I'm sorry that I don't feel better today, you guys. I really am. Um, that I'm not like my normal self in this video. But thank you for spending part of your day with me. If you didn't give this a like on your way in, please give it a like on your way out. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. We would love to have you here with us as part of our community. Um, there is a Facebook group that you can join this country girl's life and discuss cases there as well um yeah just pop off in the comments and tell me where your head's at what do you think about this testimony versus jen's testimony do you think karen saw him that morning that she was able to see him or are you in jen mccabe's camp or 
She knew he was there. That's why she saw him. I'm still not there yet. I'm still not there yet with what I've heard from the Commonwealth. I'm still not at the point that I could find her guilty. I'm just not. I still have a lot of reasonable doubt. I'm hoping maybe it will get cleared up. But next up, we have the Aruba Girls and the Aruba Incident. That will be the next video I do later today. And after them, it is Brian Higgins. And then there were some witnesses after him, including the kids, which I hate. But I will be doing a video of those witnesses because their testimony was fairly short. So I think I can fit all of them in one. Brian Higgins will have his own video. The Aruba girls will have their own video. And then everyone that came after Higgins that day will be in a video. That's the plan right now. So thank you again for joining me. And as always, I will see you all in the next one. Bye.